we're going to talk about more about the rotational kinematics. Okay. Giving you a nice little chart. What do you notice about these two? Here's the linear equations that you know. First, notice it doesn't have an x naught, but we usually say that's zero anyway, right? Okay. Um, it doesn't have an x naught in here, but usually we say that's zero. Anyway. Compare these two. They're the same. They're exactly. They're different in the linear things. Exactly. Uh, every time you'd see an A over here, you'd see an alpha over here. Every time you see a V over here, you're going to see an omega over here. Um, times are going to be the same. This time doesn't change in angular momentum. Um, let's see anything else. V naught, omega naught. Okay. They all correspond. So what you're going to find is most of the equations that you know um, translate over into an angular form. Okay. In fact, the way that we derive, do you guys remember deriving these? Vaguely? Vaguely. Okay. The derivation of these guys are exactly the same. Um, so what was something that we assumed here in order to get all of these four equations, these four kinematic equations? Constant acceleration. Constant acceleration. So if these are derived in the exact same way, what are we going to assume? Constant angular. Constant angular acceleration. So, the choice is up to you. You can either write these down in your notes, or you already know them. <laughs> Just realize what the translation are between the two. Okay. And if you wanted to write this as theta equals theta naught, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, no writing this down. I'm assuming. Right. What, are you supposed to know them or? Yeah, absolutely. You're going to use them. And they're all in the book, right? Yeah, you don't want to do that though. If you want to write down an equation, write down an equation. <laughs> um, you want to have a nice little source instead of having to go through the book. We've gone through eight chapters already and see how many equations we've got we've built up so far. We're going to go through more. There's more equations that pop up. Uh, the more you use them, the more you get used to them and kind of memorize them. These are kind of the core ones that we keep using throughout the entire semester, that's why I had to memorize it for the weekend. So, if you want to write down an equation, go for it. Or at the very least, write down that V is the same thing as omega, X is the same thing as theta, A is the same thing as alpha, and then you can translate those to math equations. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to write it down or no? Either way is fine by me. So, centrifuge rotor. You know what centrifuge is? Why do they spin? To um, make the parts separate. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's kind of like uh, if you put oil and water together. What happens to them? Oil goes, oil goes to the top, water sinks down the bottom, and it's separate. Right? Yeah. What happens if you put oil and water in space? By space, I mean like an orbiting astronaut. They bubble through, and that's it, but they don't separate. Kind of interesting. Gravity in order for them to separate. Um, so let's say if you had the, the oil and the water already together? Mm -hmm. Like if you took oil and water in a jar and shook it, you just have like little blobs of oil floating around. And if you were in space, they would never separate out to from the water. From the water. They might eventually like coagulate into a big ball or something like that. So there's surface tension between the two. Um, I wonder if I can find a video on that. Yeah, that's um, done that. What's that? Oh, you, you do use a vacuum. Same thing. Uh, why does the oil go to the top? It's lighter. Mm. Lighter is not the right word. But it's almost the right Less word. dense. Less dense. Because I can have a whole lot of oil and a little bit of water. Because I think really the water is lighter. Isn't it? What's that? Mm -hmm. The water is really lighter. It depends on how much you have of it. But it's less dense. Uh, less dense things float yeah. at to the top in other less. I think the water is really thinner than the oil. What's that? The water is thinner than the oil. Yeah, it's more dense. I don't know about thinner. Um, you're talking about viscosity, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, oil has more, is more viscous than, uh, than water, but water is more dense. Yeah. Um, so you need gravity in order to separate those two things. Now, water, water is probably heavier, too. What's that? Like a, a jar of water would be heavier than the same jar of oil. 
It was the same problem. Yeah. Now, a centrifuge rotor, its main purpose is to spin things really, really fast. And it's using um, centrifugal force in order to basically create a false gravity. If you ever read science fiction, that's kind of, or even go to NASA's website. <laughs> um, if they're, they talk about like long distance space travel, um, one of the things that a problem if you're doing space travel is without gravity, your bones get a little bit weaker, uh, your muscles atrophy, because you don't have that, you're not supporting yourself as much. Instead of trying to figure out ways to do it, one alternative is to take space station that spins around in a circle. Um, yeah that creates false gravity. Uh, and it's spinning around at such a rate that you create 9.8 meters per second. However, centrifuge rotor is doing the exact same thing, except it's creating way more gravity. Like, depending on how fast the centrifuge is, 10,000 times uh, the gravity is. Uh, they're actually very dangerous. <laughs> they stick people on them and they spin them around a little bit. Actually, we have a centrifuge rotor. So that's how they, they get the astronauts ready for the space flight. Right? Let me see if I can bring it up here so you can see what it is. Um, what's it called? Dremel Fuge. There we go. Here's a very simple one. Costs thirty dollars to make.
from that previous experiment, and it's slightly overloaded. But by the end of this experiment, you'll see that it's underloaded, and this shows just how resilient the general future is to unbalanced loads. This is it at the first setting, and I won't put it any higher than this. So pretty fast. You may or may not be able to see a ring of water forming at site from water leaking out through the factory. Okay. Um, generally, <coughs> it's used to separate things because just like water and oil, if you put it into a jar and it's in space, there's no gravity, they won't separate up. Um, now, if you do it with your blood, your blood's made up of a lot of different things, water, uh, white blood cells, red blood cells. White blood cells, red blood cells have different densities to them. Um, and if you put them under take that blood, for instance, and you put it under a higher amount of gravity, they'll actually separate just like the oil and the water does. It's just it doesn't normally happen, and luckily it doesn't happen, otherwise we wouldn't work out. So your, all your blood cells would be one, one, one place? And yeah, so you get different layers uh, of stuff. They do it with other things too, like with DNA. So like only one of the layers would actually be red? And yeah, the and then you have like a white layer and you can extract, you could take a little needle and extract whatever you wanted, which would be a more pure substance. So it's a way to separate things. Um, so that's kind of the purpose of a centrifuge rotor, because a centrifuge rotor will basically increase gravity. And why are they dangerous? It's forming. Yeah, if you have it, even if the actual rotor, that thing right there was built in properly, if one side had a little bit more mass than the other side, you start getting this wobbly thing and it would tear itself apart and fly apart. Very dangerous. Or if you just took those two test tubes that you have, and a little of them kind of like on the same side, you get that same effect. If you're going at 10,000 RPM or something like that, you're increasing gravity by quite a bit. So like a gram of something is going to weigh so many times more. We could figure out how much that is. I don't think this problem has that, have us do that specifically, but we have all the physics we need in order to do that. So you get the point of a centrifuge, right? Because that was essential to this problem. I just want you to know what it is. It's not central to the problem. I could just say it's something that spins. But so that's going to twenty. So that was going to twenty thousand RPM. So this one's twenty. Yeah, in thirty seconds. So it's accelerated from rest to this. When you see RPM, what do you think of? Which one of those variables do you think of? Rotations per minute. What's that? Rotations per minute. Mm -hmm. Or revolutions per minute, if you want to say it that way too. But which one of the variables in this guy are you thinking of? Should be thinking about one. Omega. Even though it's not, omega is measured in radians per second, this, oops, so it's probably not a handheld centrifuge. So when you see this RPM, think of omega. This is omega, it's just in the wrong units, okay? It's kind of like me saying miles per hour. Okay. Um, in 30 seconds, that's the right answer. What's the average angular acceleration? Okay, let's figure this out. How do we do this? First we convert RPM into radians per second. Mm -hmm. So we
um, goes for 30 seconds. What's the average angular acceleration? So I need one of these equations. I now have omega, final omega. Um, omega what I, equals omega naught plus AT. That'll do it, because I have final omega. Do I have initial omega? Yes. What is it? Zero. Zero. Didn't say that. Though. Yes, it did. Did it? Said it starts at first. Ah, OK, but it didn't say zero. <laughs> My main point is it wasn't exactly in there. But this is our omega right here. We have our initial omega. It's 30 seconds, so omega equals omega naught plus omega times time. Um, 2,000 Looks like we have one sig fig for these guys. Okay. Um, 70, 70 um, radians per second squared. Okay. Um, through how many revolutions does centrifuge turn during its acceleration period? How many revolutions? So what are they asking me for when they say revolutions? What, which variable are you thinking? of these guys right here. Theta. What's that? Theta. Theta, yes. Um, which we need to convert theta, which is radians, into rotations. That shouldn't be too bad. Um, which one of these equations are we going to use? Well, we have acceleration. Mm -hmm. We need one with theta in it. So uh, probably so the second one. Second one. We have initial. We have acceleration, so that should do. It's going about 2,500 rotations per minute on average. Does that make sense? No. We go 5,000 rotations. Oh, it would be 10,000 rotations per minute. If it were if it on average during that time period, yes. On average during that time period. If we were just going at a constant speed. So let's try this one. Bicycle wheel slows down uniformly from 8.4 meters per second. Now, what are they giving me here? The linear velocity mm -hmm. of the wheel to rest over a distance of 115 meters. 
Each wheel of the tire has an overall diameter of 68 centimeters. Determine the angular velocity of the wheels at the initial instant. Um, B, the total number of revolution the wheel rotates before coming to rest. C, the angular acceleration of the wheel. D, the time it took to come to a stop. Okay. Um, so let's try and analyze what's going on here. We've got a wheel. What part of this wheel is going 8.4 meters per second? The edge. The edge. Okay. Um, the way that I think about it is at the center, it's going 8. Basically, the whole wheel is traveling at that speed, which means this bottom part, in order for it to be moving forward, has to be rotating like this at 8 4 meters per second. Okay, that's useful um, because they gave us the diameter of the wheel 68, so that's going to be 34 centimeters. basic idea going. Now, is halfway between the wheel, is it moving at 8.4 meters per second? No. Faster or slower? Slower. Until all the way up until the center. How fast is this? Like right before, it's almost zero, right? But the entire wheel, the center of mass, is moving at 8.4 meters per second. So that's what I mean. Um, let's figure out the angle velocity, angular velocity of the wheel. So we're translating a linear velocity into an angular velocity. Do we have an equation to do that? By the way, that doesn't, these guys don't work. They don't transfer angular into linear. These are just trying to relate the angular velocities to each other. Um, these are trying to relate the linear velocities together. You multiply by r for transfer an angular into a linear. Mm -hmm. So a, v equals omega r. How do I remember it? Just as we're good. So I didn't, like, the second one I asked the question, how do I translate V into there? I knew I'd have to multiply R by something. How did I figure it out without actually having to memorize it? Just trying to get help with it. So you don't have to look it up like you just did. You know how I remember it. What's that? I know how I remember it. How do you remember it? I remember that Omega is talking about the union circle. And so to get it in terms of R, you just multiply it. Another way to do it, it's excellent and just fine way. Keep it and always use it so that you never have to look it up again. Um, just look at the units. Radians per second times meters. Radians are unitless, so that's why I'm multiplying radians per second times radius to get velocity. The units need to work out. If I did it the other way, I wouldn't get the right units. Um, so that's 8.4 equals omega times... Got that. Now, up here, the velocity we just discussed isn't the same velocity as 8.4. It's a little bit lower. What about its angular velocity at this position? It's the same. It's the same. Okay, it's the same all the way through this circle. Um, so let's do part B. The total number of revolutions the wheel rotates before coming to rest. You don't even need to worry about acceleration because we know how far it moves. Um, 
we could translate this right here is equivalent to radius. We can translate this way. Um, the way you're thinking about it is absolutely correct. Okay, well, in fact, um, this wheel, what's the arc length of the wheel that it's going through as it's spinning right here? It's going to go a total of 150 meters, right? Um, it, it's going to be the exact same thing that we're doing. L equals theta times R. Is that translation? Um, so L, in this case, is 150 <coughs> equals the angle times 8.4. No, that's its linear velocity. We're talking about angular velocity. What's its initial angular velocity? So we're looking at something that has radians per second. That's 
So this one over here. It is going to be a really small number. Think about what the initial angular velocity was. It's really slow. Think about how many radians it's traveling. Okay, it's traveling that far. Let's talk about this negative here. We usually declare that going to the right is positive, going to the left is negative, or we can change it up if we feel it works out better. Same thing for up and down. However, negative in this case means something different. It doesn't mean going left or going right. What is it talking about? Down. Slowing down, but not, not just slowing down, because we could say the same thing for... Slowing down in the opposite direction that we've declared positive. Correct. Which way have we declared positive? The way it's moving. Which is, which way? It doesn't say any problem. It doesn't, but way, we've drawn a picture of it, right? So the right. So which way is it? Which way is what? Positive. Right. No, positive is not the right. When we're talking about angular velocity, there is no right and left. There is clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay. Which way have we declared positive? Clockwise. clockwise. So this angular acceleration is going counterclockwise. So that makes sense. It's important to understand that you're going to get positive and negative, but positive in rotation, we're talking about rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. Uh, D. How much time did it take to come to a stop? We know that um, omega equals omega naught plus a t. Mm -hmm. And now omega. Oh, omega. Okay. Um, omega naught. Final omega. Zero. Yeah, zero. And we have our initial, it's 0.04. And we don't have alpha, or we have alpha, we just figured that out and we just need to know the time. Okay. So I got time equals. So we take negative, I do uh, omega naught, which is 0.04, mm -hmm. divide that by negative 2.37 times 10 to the negative 6. That gives us a really big number. Sure. 16,900. Which I think is in the terms of hours. Well, divide by 60, divide by, so divide by 3,060, 3, 3,600. Seems unrealistic. Yeah. Okay, what do we do? I think our alpha is wrong because that seems unrealistic to me. Okay. Um, so we've got this speed, we squared it. Yeah. But that just makes it smaller. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to divide by 2. Yeah. And then we're going to 
and divide by 330. Yeah, 2.37 times 106. Um, maybe our angle is wrong. 115 divided by 0.34. 8.4 divided by 0.34. Uh, that's it. 24. What? I probably did it wrong. Yeah. So there's our mistake right there. I should have caught that. My bad. Um, but our omega is wrong, which would then translate into everything else. Everything is wrong. else is wrong. It's not gonna take four hours, but the idea is still the same. Where do we make a mistake? all the same. Now, this last one I could have figured out the time it takes. I didn't have to use angular velocity. What's another way I could have solved this to get the time? You know it's initial linear velocity. Mm -hmm. and since that's the velocity of the whole wheel, you can just say velocity equals time. You're right. I could have, I could have used this initial velocity. I know it's final velocity. I know the distance, so I could find the acceleration, the linear acceleration. Knowing the linear acceleration, I could then find time using just linear equations, and I would get the exact same time. Okay? Um, let's continue. Now, I know you didn't look at what a torque wrench was. I asked Jake if things like torque is when you apply pressure in the rotational direction. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But what do you mean by pressure? So, with, we've got a situation where we've got a rotation axis right here. Okay, it's looking down on the door. Can you see that, right? Okay. Um, what's the difference between these two? These two force vectors right here um, are the same, but what's different about them? Like what their effect is going to be different? Power versus speed. Yeah, if you hit an A, you get more leverage, and if you hit it, B, you'll get more speed. The door will move more quickly. Door won't, door won't move more quickly. I think at A, the force Well, you'd have, have to apply more force. It'd be harder to push. But at B, you have more control. B, you have more control? I don't know. We have a door. We can do it. I don't know if you have more control or not. What do you mean by control? I don't know. I'm just thinking about like a baseball bat. Oh, where are you swinging? Well, you hit the ball though. Hit the ball with it. It the is because net. you're kind of swinging it around where your hands are. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about this. At since the um, fulcrum is where the hinge is, at A you're further away from the fulcrum, so your force will cause it to move more distance. However, <coughs> they will both move the same in terms of in terms of how the change in part in change of, in terms of the change of theta. In terms of the change of theta. I think I missed on something said there. This guy right here is going to move the door much faster. Mm -hmm. More easily, if you want. If this has some sort of like spring mechanism like our doors do, um, this one's your best point of pushing it, right? You get more, you don't get more force, you get more something else. We call it torque. Torque. Okay. And it has directly to do with how much force you apply and 
how far away from the rotation axis you're pushing. Okay. Um, so if I push here, it's easier to move the door. However, Ryan, you're right, there's a trade-off. It's not as easy to move here. Okay. It won't move as quickly. However, what's the trade-off? It's the distance that you travel. This one has to travel greater distance, and this one has to travel a less distance. So there is somewhat of a trade-off. I think the, the catapult. What's that? Well, I don't think it's a catapult. It'll get more speed if you hit it close you, to the fulcrum. Yeah. You don't get more speed if it's close to the close to the axis of rotation. Yeah. On it, like if this right here was a catapult instead, and it's flipping up like that. But whatever's on the edge, on the tip. If it's at the speed. tip, it'll get more speed. But it has to travel a greater distance in order to get more speed. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, torque, um, do you recall what work is equipped, what the equation for work is? Force times distance? Yes, force times distance. Displacement. Or displacement. But the force has to be parallel to the displacement. It has to be parallel. Okay. Now, torque, which I use the Greek letter tau, okay, do you represent? is equal to force perpendicular to the lever arm, okay. or the moment arm. It's also called the moment arm. Um, the moment arm is the distance from the axis to the point where you're pushing. Okay. And they have to be perpendicular. Now torque, in this case, is different than work. Work, uh, is it a vector or a scalar? Sometimes it's a vector. Yeah, but in this case, I'm guessing it's a scalar. It's a scalar for work. Torque, however, is a vector. It has a direction. Okay. Why does it have a direction? Well, and here's the screw in your bear. <laughs> Give me a chin. What are you I don't know. I'm just get you. It's 10.51. Now it's Okay, uh, the torque is you put your hand on the lever arm and you rotate your fingers. You have to use your right hand first. You use your left hand. Any of you guys left hand? Or in case you use your left hand? Because it'll make everything backwards. It's called the right hand rule. Um, you put your hand along the lever and then you bend your fingers in the direction of the force vectors. And that points your thumb outward when you do that. Torque, in this case, is actually going outward, out of the page. It's a vector going out of the page. And if we multiply the force times the lever arm, we get a number for it. What are the units for this one? We usually call it joules, but we could have also said newton meters, right? What's the units for this one? Newton meters. Okay, torque's units are newton meters. That's why, in general, for work, we don't call them newton meters. Every once in a while, you're going to see newton meters. But usually, we call them joules. Otherwise, the units aren't going to tell you what it is. Um, what if I pushed the other way? If I was using the right hand rule, like the forces were going down, I put my hand along the lever arm and bend my fingers towards the force vector in the direction of the force vector is, and notice how it's going into the board now. Okay. That's why torques can counteract each other. They can either be out of the rotation axis or into the rotation axis. Yeah. Right. Um, it has to be perpendicular. So if it's not perpendicular, like if it was a force vector that was coming at an angle like this, how would I figure it out? How much torque is there at that position? need to figure out what its vertical component is. Which is not bad. That's that. Okay. And then multiply that number, whatever that is, times R. Uh, they have a formula in your book to do it automatically, 
but you have to know where the angle is because they can throw the angle on the other side and you have to do 90 minus that angle. So I would give it that way. I usually just leave it like this. So it makes, because really you just want the perpendicular force to the lever. Is that all right? Okay. Um, <coughs> Biceps torque. Bicep is muscle that exerts a, ex a vertical force on a lower arm than the shown. For each case, calculate the torque about its axis of rotation through the elbow joint, assuming the muscle is attached 0.5 centimeters from the elbow is shown. Okay. Um, if you look here, here's the axis of rotation. The muscles attached to the arm actually a little bit further away from that axis of rotation. Oh, otherwise you can move your arm, right? Right, you, you bend this bicep up and it curls it up. Okay. Um, you can figure out how much torque you have in order to do that. Um, we won't go through this problem because I don't have enough time right now. Um, but what I want to comment on is if you look at an ape's arm, it's a little bit different than ours. It's not they're a lot stronger than we are, or we say that they're a lot stronger than us, um, but they're actually just built physically different. It's not that they have necessarily more muscles. Like they just move it out this, here. This point where it actually attaches to um, it's further out. Start, it's actually further out. Why would that be beneficial for them? Because it gives them more torque. It gives them more torque. Yeah. Okay. And gives them this sort of illusion of being stronger necessarily. If you yeah. went into like an arm wrestling match with an ape, you would probably win. <laughs> yeah. And it's because of this torque. Um, no homework tonight.